this is what our statement is now as far as anticoagulation goes. And I guess uh, there are different practices all around, but we do believe that with the new uh, technology we've got with heparin coated tubing, with new generation oxygenators, we don't have to go for aggressive anticoagulation anymore. Um, we usually aim for APDTs of 1.5 to 2 times normal, which is not different to what we usually go for in CVVH. And yes, we do stop heparin on ECMO if it's indicated for bleeding usually. usually. Um, and yes, in that situation, we do give clotting factors as well. And uh, in some severe bleeders uh, post -cardi uh, cardiotomy, obviously, um, we'd give them factor 7A. And so far, so good, keep fingers crossed, our patients, uh, well, most of the patients are bleeding, and we hadn't had any catastrophic clotting event with the application of factor 7 on ECMO. Although in the literature, there had been fertility, so we're not taking it easy, actually. There is a problem, a potential problem, that you basically clot up your circuit in no time, and if that happens, obviously, there's, uh, that is a fatality in most cases. Okay, but uh, I think the take-home message there is really you don't have to use that much heparin anymore. Okay, this is the reason why. This is a little bit of history here. Actually, oxygenator technology and tubing as well have changed a lot. This is 60s, 70s, bubble oxygenators. That's what's done in, in, uh, in uh, cardiac theaters. You basically just pump oxygen through blood. There's a lot of uh, trauma to the blood, obviously. So it was an advantage to have these new um, oxygenators in the 80s, which were micropores, so you had two phases, a gas phase and a blood phase, basically, and gas, gas just went through. However, with the small pores in there, actually, there was leakage to them. So after two or three days, they started to actually leak, and you had uh, quite a bit of um, plasma actually coming out of them, and you had to change them every few days. The next generation, late 90s, were silicon oxygenators. They hadn't had any pores anymore, and they lasted longer, but they were not that effective. So since about 2002, this is really a breakthrough as far as ECMO goes. The um, Quadrox oxygenator, which is a uh, PMP, don't ask me what it stands for, but uh, it's non microporous, and I have to take that away. Um, the longest reported use for that one was 59 days, the same oxygenator on ECMO. So they last forever, really, not all of them, but. Uh, uh, they are really, really a breakthrough as far as ECMO technology goes. Okay. Uh, looking into the evidence and uh, what's there so far, there are three randomized controlled trials, two I mentioned already, out of the 70s and out of the uh, 90s. Both, I think, are not appropriate to be uh, looked at at this time anymore because the technology has changed that much. Our patients are not bleeding that badly anymore. And uh, therefore, I wouldn't uh, acknowledge them at this point anymore. They've both been negative, and that was why the conception in 2001 was basically if you put someone in ECMO, you, you know, they're going to die anyway. Now, the, the one published in Lancet in 2009 is one from the Glanfield, uh, or Leicester Group in Glanfield Hospital, UK. Um, and this is the trial, the only randomized controlled trial. Um, where they screened 766 patients with severe ADS, 180 been enrolled in the ECMO group, and 100, uh, sorry, 90 in ECMO group and 90 in conventional treatments. The ECMO group was all transferred over to that treatment hospital in Leicester. That was the only place at the time where they were able to do ECMO. Um, and the survival rate with six months without disability was 66, 63% for ECMO and 47% with out and that was significant, so a positive trial if you want. Although that has been discussed for uh, at least one or two reasons. First, uh, not all the patients who've been randomized actually to ECMO received ECMO, so it was intention to treat and, and some patients been transferred to, to Leicester and then um, less, the Leicester team reviewed the patient once they arrived and said, well, they're not too bad actually in 16 patients out of the 90 and they uh, decided not to put them on. And few of those patients actually died, unfortunately, also while they've been transferred over to ECMO, uh, to, to the ECMO center in Leicester. So it was intention to treat rather than ECMO itself. And since the other, the control group actually was left at the hospital, 
where they came from, you wonder how their standards been actually. And you can see here, it was matched in most of the um, cases. However, a proper lung protective ventilation was present in 93% in Leicester, but only 70% of the control group. So it might be that just, they were just more um, sophisticated and was just better set up to ventilate a patient properly. So there are concerns there. If you ask me about the evidence of cardiac ECMO or VA ECMO, there's none. A no randomized controlled trial anyway. We know or we assume that all those patients being referred for VA ECMO probably would die otherwise. So we've got these outcome or survival rates here reported somewhere between 34, depending on the indication, to 45%. So one would assume that these patients are actually, or that there is a in effect treating it, but uh, I guess there will never be a randomized controlled trial on it, I'm afraid. And well, this lack of evidence obviously led Dr. Hoopmeyer from, um, from US, one of the leading intensivists over there, uh, states this. This time, we do not support the pos uh, position that a nation, as a nation, we should invest in the development of additional ECMO centers, and that was after the H1N1. So he's not convinced, he's not a believer. And well, let's see if we actually um, follow him and, and uh, really obey to our US colleagues. Um, maybe not, because this is, these are the data from the ELSO database till 2009. As you can see, respiratory or VV ECMO, a steady increase. Actually, this is obviously H1N1, but for 2010, I've got the data up here, it's still trend upward. And for cardiac ECMO, same thing. Over the last 20 years, there is an increase actually on adult patient being treated with, um, with ECMO. This is what happens in, in the scientific world. Publications on humans, on adult humans, um, in the last six years. And there's a steady increase as well. Again, 2009 was different with H1N1, but overall it went up. This is just what we've done last six years. Um, we started off in 2004 with just a couple of cases. And for the last three years or so, uh, we're doing about 35 to 40 ECMOs, ECMO runs every year. And we were quite surprised last year, actually, that we'd had almost the same number of ECMOs without H1N1 than we had actually in 2009. So there seems to be a trend to there, at least in our hospital. Okay, um, so that's what's happening with us here at the moment. Actually, we get patients in quite often, actually, is the retrieval team just bringing in a patient. And this is our first patient with the total artificial heart just doing its first laps in the unit there. So it's a bit of traffic jam in the, in the unit there. And this is also to acknowledge the other main players. This is um, Roger Pye, who just brought the patient in, is one of the anesthetists here. Andrew Jackson, who's another anesthetist there. Jeff Breeding is the uh, CNC in ICU, in, involved in ECMO quite a lot, and he's running that course, which you may hear about very soon via the, uh, the website, I guess. Our research nurse, Claire, over here as well, so we're looking for a new case, actually, to be randomized. And, uh, well, this is what we do at the moment. Let's see what the future brings, although that's, of course, a guess um, only. There are more trials on the way, so some of the uh, non-believers may be uh, happy after that trial that happens. The EOLA trial, which is a French-led trial, um, is going to randomize ARDS patients again, a slightly different way than they've done with the CESAR trial, and they're aiming for a higher number of patients, multi-center trial, which actually involves the alpha one, and we hope we get our uh, sticker up here as well. Um, and uh, that may or may not answer the question of uh, indications for severe ARDS. There's another way to look at, ARDS, uh, at ECMO, and that's a minimal invasive approach using ECMO only to remove CO2. That's not new, neither. It's been described already in the 90s. However, uh, there's a renaissance on that. And the intention here is basically to, to do even a more or less invasive ventilation, to aim not for our six mils per kg of tidal volume, but for four mils to protect the lungs even further. Obviously, what you have to do then is to get rid of the CO2 somehow, and you can do that extracorporally. And the good thing about it is that 
you don't need a lot of technology with it. That reminds you of on a hemofilter. It's actually been designed from a hemofilter, but it can remove CO2. You, you need, and in fact, you don't need much more than a VASCAT and a blood flow of about 400 mils a minute. So much less than you would need actually for oxygenation. And in a pilot trial, these Italian investigators could find that they were able to reduce CO2 from about 75 down to normal 50 or so, just putting those patients onto ECMO. It doesn't uh, do a lot on, on oxygenation, but still you've been able to reduce pressures and tidal volumes quite a lot, and that's what they want to investigate now in a larger multi-center multi randomized control trial. Other things which are also happening around the world, we've done one case here, um, ambulatory ECMO or ECMO for extubated patients. We've done one case, that's not our case, but uh, ours was fairly similar. We'd had a CF patient um, um, who was waiting for a lung transplant but deteriorated actually while waiting. And um, she was young and otherwise healthy and obviously a good candidate for transplant. So uh, she needed to be intubated. We put her on ECMO and since we wanted to avoid the negative effects of ventilation, immobilization, uh, deconditioning, um, while waiting for a transplant, uh, we actually extub extubated the patient on day three. We got her out of bed, we've done the usual physio things and everything, and she eventually got transplanted uh, after I think 12 days on ECMO, um, came off ECMO after that transplant and went via rehab. So she's done well, and more centers around the world are going down that pathway now. And some, uh, uh, the way that this is possible now is, is again technology. Again, we've got different catheters now. So this is a double lumen um, catheter which basically drains blood from the IVC and the SVC and returns the blood close to the uh, tricuspic valve. You can't run high, high-ish flows with that, but usually they are high enough actually to achieve de a decent saturation of about 85 to 90 percent. And you can, you've got only one cannula, the femoral side is not touched, so you can sit up the patient properly. And uh, you can even extubate the patient if you want. This is from unpublished uh, survey I've done on a number of uh, centers around the world. See about 100 ECMO specialists responded to that and I asked them actually what kind of sedation score do you uh, do you want to achieve on your, your ECMO patient? And surprisingly to me actually, more than 50% of the, uh, these ECMO centers replied that they want to have the patient either cooperative and tonkal or responsive. And only uh, less than 50% is still going for the classical way, and we do that most of the time as well. Deep sedation, um, no, even paralyzing at some time. So there's a trend actually allowing patients to wake up on ECMO, which is probably a good thing do, but uh, it probably will change the whole way you decide for indications as well as you're going to handle those kind of cases as well. Okay. I hope I had created enough <laughs> of uh, um, complications and, and wiring here, and I'm uh, happy to take some questions.